And now our gospel reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What, what deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And, and they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about the village, about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. So, um, Deanna, in the back, I think they might already have them, but there's some little sets of stuff. Yeah, all right, great. Um, we, we always have stuff for our kids, uh, special lessons and things for them while they're there, so we're checking on that. So now, Fourth uh, of July and a sermon. As many of you know, I usually have trepidation preaching the Sunday closest to July 4th. And uh, this year, that Sunday is July 4th. Uh-oh. Oh, oh my. <laughs> well, in my experience, most Americans celebrate their religious freedom by not coming to church on such a Sunday. But often there's a bit of an I dare you feel among many church people wanting flags, the national anthem, etc. as part of a worship service for God. And as at least some of you know, I am staunchly opposed to turning national holidays into liturgical ones. I treasure our national holidays. I'm not against them. But they are not liturgical holidays. They are not worship of God. So I'm, I'm against turning that into what my liturgy is going to be. For July 4th, quite honestly, that would border on nationalistic idolatry. But I do want to be clear that I am grateful and I treasure the freedoms granted in this country. When I was in ninth grade, I had a, a teacher. Surprise, right? This was a history teacher. Now, my mother was also a teacher. She was a teacher of social studies of history and government and consumer economics and things like that. She taught in East LA at Woodrow Wilson High School, which is right near Cal State LA. She started off when it was actually a combination, junior high and high school down in East LA before they built the new, which is now old, Woodrow Wilson High School. Anyway, I complained to her about my ninth grade history teacher because he was saying, well, how can everybody be equal? How can we do, do, he was challenging what were treasured impressions of what was so great about the United States. Many times in history, as I was growing up, we were taught um, that the Pledge of Allegiance was practically a prayer you know, and, and that everything in that was just holy and that our country could do no wrong. He was challenging this. And I was getting my dander up because 
I was, you know, somewhat, somewhat patriotic. But what I was patriotic about was the freedoms that we actually have. I was not patriotic about us going into other countries and trying to take them over. I was not patriotic about colonization. I was not patriotic about racism. I hated the Vietnam War. You know, I mean, just all of these things. I, I did not hate the soldiers. You know, I, I just was angry that we were in this conflict. It was a conflict, right? It wasn't really a war. Anyway, uh, so, but, but he was, he was, what he was doing, and I just didn't get it right away. He was challenging us. He was saying, well, communism must be better, right? But what he was making us do was learn that it, that it wasn't. What he was making us do was find the things that were really real and important about our liberty, about our Bill of Rights. He, he would actually get us to actually go find the Bill of Rights and talk about what was in it and find the Declaration of Independence. So he was doing this by challenging us. Sometimes I think that when people are challenged now, they simply become defensive and irate, and they will not listen to truth. And we honestly have to shake the dust off our sandals. Anyway, I hope I'm clear. I'm grateful for the freedoms. If it weren't for those freedoms, I couldn't even be here preaching. I will push and I will shove and come as close to fighting as possible without being violent to defend that freedom for anybody. Especially for people who are denied it or who have been historically denied it by the very country that supposedly stands for liberty and justice for all. I almost played a song, a video, of a song called Patriot by Jackson Brown that this women's band that I was a part of uh, did. I didn't want to fill up too much of our service time, so I didn't bring it in. <clears throat> I might do it at the end and pull it off my computer for you. But um, <clears throat> it's a wonderful song, and it talks about not being a communist or an imperialist or a Republican or a Democrat, but I'm for freedom. That's what that song is about. And it, it's a great song, and I have posted it on Facebook in several spots. You can find it and listen to it there. So today is about freedom. It's about following freedom. It's about sharing freedom. And today's prescribed lectionary, the scriptures for today, they give us a lot of thought on freedom and the gift of the Spirit liberating us, not for fireworks, hot dogs, and beer, but for holiness. Through a series of events, David, who had already been king of Judah for seven years, was anointed king of Israel. And then for 33 years, he led a united people who had once been divided. I think that's key. He united the people. His rise to leadership was inevitable, but not because he was a great politician. It was more about his variety of interests. His, he was an athlete, a warrior, a musician, a writer, composer, poet, all of these things, and he kept pointing to God. God is calling men and women today to change our world by unifying the loyalties and purposes of humanity for a sacred commitment, a sacred commitment, a commitment to holiness. The amazing thing about David is this. It was hinted to in verse 10 of Donna's reading. David became greater and greater for the Lord was with him. Well, what was this greatness? Because when you really check out the details, you grown-ups here, when you check out the details about David, sometimes he was a vicious autocrat. He pummeled his foes. There are all kinds of dual plots in his story, his chicanery, his affairs, his daring do, his having someone killed so that he could be with their wife. My goodness, he was a real screw up, you know? But he kept coming back to God. It is constant repentance and reaching to God, constant awareness of the failures and at the same time of the gift of God and the love and the grace and the freedom that God offers. It seems clear that God works through and works despite the tawdry, unholy ways of politics in the corridors of power. I do know that God's word never returns void. We are promised that. God's word will never return void. God can work through, 
and God can work despite man's foolishness. And then the gospel story. Don't you just love the skeptics, Jesus' skeptics? Isn't this just this local boy? You know, we saw him grow up in Nazareth. He can't, can't quite believe in him. Have you ever been away and accomplished things? Maybe, maybe earned your degrees, you know, maybe gone to school, maybe learned new skills, whatever you've done, and you come back home, and whoever's at home still treats you like the little kid you were before you left? Yeah, that's what was happening here. It was obviously not a social visit that he planned. He didn't come just to see old friends and family. He came as a rabbi. He came as a teacher with all of his disciples in tow and went to the synagogue as itinerant rabbis would do. They would be welcomed to teach when they were visiting. He would go there and he began to teach. And Mark reports that they were all astonished at what he had to say. And then, like typical hometown critics, they're like, well, where does he get off saying all this? Who does he think he is? He couldn't possibly know all this. You can just hear all this critical rhetoric. Hey, we've known this fellow since he was a kid. We saw when he messed up. We know his mama, we know his brothers, we know his sisters. He's just a carpenter. He's no better than us. Who does he think he is? And they took offense. Well, when we wonder about why, we might have to dig a little deeper and look at another gospel. So I turn you to, to Luke, who enlightens us about what happened. When Jesus went into the synagogue, he read from a scroll from Isaiah. And here's what the scroll said. It said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim a release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To let the oppressed go free. That challenges people in power, guys. Then he handed the scroll back to the attendant and sat down and said, Today that scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He was clearly claiming, proclaiming himself as Messiah. Well, they were not only amazed, they were enraged, and they ran him out of town, took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built, and was gonna, they were going to throw him off the cliff. But he kind of disappeared and passed through the midst of them away. Hmm. So I'm sure that Jesus and his disciples were to say the least, disappointed about this, this mess that happened. So then he says, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, right? He's, uh, he's kind of complaining there, isn't he? Yeah, I would, I would too. Mark reports that Jesus could do no mighty works among them except for the healing of some sick people. And all of this was because of their unbelief. You know, it's true now. We see, even now, that when people are convinced of something, no matter how insane, no matter how inaccurate, no matter what, no matter how many real facts, many real studies, stuff pointed out, they're still convinced in what is a big lie. The big lie being propagated by somebody else to gain power, usually. They're convinced of it, and it's nearly impossible to enlighten them. When I see this, I pay attention to the part about shaking the dust off our feet. I continue doing what I do. I continue working for good in community. But I'm not going to be bothered with these people. They're not worth the dust on my sandals. The fight, I mean. Not. They are worth God's love. But they have to be the ones to accept it. When we experience rejection and threats, especially when it comes from people you thought might support you. There's a tendency to withdraw, lick your wounds, kind of reevaluate. But this wasn't the case with Jesus, was it? He had had a positive response before coming back to Nazareth, and he knows he will have another positive response when he leaves. So now, instead of just hiding, what does he do? He ratchets up his campaign. Up until this point, the disciples have been doing what? They've been following along. They've been hearing the stories. They've been listening. But now, now it's time, he says, for them to get actively involved. He calls them together and gives them power over unclean spirits and authority to heal. And then they're sent on this daunting mission where they just witnessed this big rejection and they're, they might be afraid. But he arms them with something that no disciple dares begin such an undertaking without. 
He gives them power, and he gives them authority, and he gave them the freedom, the power to truly act. We have more power than we realize. It takes us recognizing that, because we have the freedom to be followers of Christ, to be disciples of Christ, and to act in Christ's name. When we look at what needs to be done in our churches, and we think, oh, I do not have the power to do this. This is too much. We're missing the whole core of the gospel message. Listen to this. What God, what God calls us to do, God empowers us to do. What God calls us to do, God empowers us to do. If the only things that happen in our churches are the things we do in our own power, we get a lot of reason for concern. God calls, God empowers. There are days and weeks in my own ministry when I have ended up in a state of frustration and emotional and physical exhaustion. And you know when that was happening? It was when I was operating out of my own power. And I was not embracing and using the power that God gives. When I looked at all the work that needs to be done here with our building, especially when we came back to be opening up, I was just completely overwhelmed. I was like, really? I, you know, I didn't go to school for this. You know? And yet, God empowers us. And the community, this community, it is rallying around us to help us get it done. Uh, partly with, with DeAndre's foundation. Thank you for visiting us here today, DeAndre. His foundation has been helping us. And then last week, a gentleman came who's a very well-known builder, yeah. uh, built Town Square. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he came to take a look at the window inside and out and to see what we could do to restore that. Um, we, have, we have all sorts of people from all levels of community that are taking an interest and trying to figure out what they can do to help restore this beautiful historic place. How awesome is that? See, I didn't have to figure out how to do that all by myself, did I? I did reach out and say, hey, we need some help scraping some paint. And then look what happened. <laughs> anyway, so the disciples, they're sent. The reason I say that, that I don't have that power or those resources. The disciples were sent out in what way? No food, no money, not even a change of clothing, right? Not even two tunics. They were to trust God to provide whatever they needed to get through to those to whom they were sent. If they were rejected, they were to shake the dust off their feet and leave. They were to free themselves of it. The power and authority of Jesus did not forsake them. They cast out demons, they anointed with oil and healed people. Someone once said that Jesus promised three things to those who followed him. They would be absurdly happy, entirely fearless, and always in trouble. <laughs> Probably true. Yeah. They knew, they absolutely knew who they were. They knew what they were about, they knew what their mission was, they knew what their purpose and their identity was. So, what is our identity? Whether our identity as individuals, as congregations, as communities, or as other organizations, as entire countries, we are given the opportunity to solidify who we are, especially in our relationship to the divine. For both David and Jesus, it was their sense of calm. Second Samuel recalls that David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and the text establishes a sense of authority for David's monarchy, authority from God. Faced with questions, Jesus establishes authority in his hometown and looks beyond the boundary of his family structure to his identity in God. In this collection of texts for today, whether we're in times of victory or we are in times of vulnerability, God is with us. We find our strength, identity, sense of call, and freedom through God as seen in Jesus the Christ. Today is an historic day here in the U.S. Maya Angelou once wrote about history. She said that this was in uh, On the Pulse of Morning, her poem in 1993. She said, it cannot be unlived. 
but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. That's a hopeful sentiment. It's worth to personally explore the implications of that, but it's also an appropriate truth to be reminded of during this weekend observance of our nation's freedom. It is a hopeful truth for people to know that they are not bound to repeat the sins of their forebears. They are free from that if they choose to accept and follow that freedom. It is hopeful for people to consider the possibility of a future that can in fact be different. I hope that this is a lesson that this nation has learned well, or at least is on the way to learning, albeit through wrenching, painful, and shameful periods of history. Don't lose, fact of, don't lose sight of the fact that Miss Angelou was, was born into a society where she was not fully free. She was rele relegated to inferior status because of her race and her gender. And yet, during her lifetime, she went from the segregated confinement of a pre-civil rights America to an America in which someone much like her was elected to the nation's highest office. Getting to that historical point required traveling on a long, wrenching, painful road. But because it was faced with courage, we are now a people who, in spite of all of the bumps in the road, continue to work to overcome our past. Of course, there's a lot going on that suggests that some of the honest and hard work that has been done is being <coughs> retargeted, that some factions are attempting to undo the good work. So it is time for this nation to once again take collective stock of what we value and what we stand for. And we should not shy away from continuing that work with the power that we are given. Our story as a nation has sorrowful downsides. Slavery and racism, manifest destiny, jingoistic nationalism, economic selfishness, disastrous military adventures, periodic spasms of fear and hatred of the outsider, especially the immigrant. Our foundational self-understanding here is dicey in another way, because from the start, many Americans have believed that our preeminent position in the world is divinely ordained, that America is on an errand for God. There are many, I have to put quotes around this, Christians in America who sincerely believe that an ardent patriotism is basic not just to citizenship, but to the Christian faith. I did a survey of church websites around the 4th of July a few years ago. It turned out, to my dismay, that many churches were planning to begin their services with a parade of American flags. There were sermons in support of wars and great reverence expressed for the ultimate sacrifice. One congregation heard a sermon entitled, God, the Greatest American. I imagine that many people left worship in those times more persuaded than ever to pledge allegiance to America is to pledge allegiance to Jesus and to stand up for Jesus is to stand up for our country. The founding story of America has given rise to a vision of America not only as an exceptional nation but also as a Christian nation. And sometimes we see people gathered around a cross draped in stars and stripes. I have to tell you, that is disrespectful not just to the cross and to God. It is disrespectful to the flag. It is actually against flag etiquette. You see, flag etiquette says that wherever the US flag is displayed, it should be the highest flag. It should be the thing that gives your primary allegiance wherever it is displayed. But here, in a sanctuary, in a church, in our time of worship. What is our commandment? We worship the Lord our God. We do not worship other things, other idols. Which means the flag can't be the preeminent thing in this sanctuary. So we don't put it in here because it would disrespect the flag and it would disrespect God. It can be outside on the pole. You can pledge allegiance. I've led the Pledge of Allegiance for the City Council. 
It's fine. It's great. I actually am patriotic. But not about God. Jesus pledges allegiance only to God. At least that's the way I read the Gospels. He taught that loyalty to God did not mean standing apart from others. It meant standing in solidarity with others. And one of the most important words in theology is with. God is with us. Jesus was God with us. Emmanuel, his nickname, literally means God with us. That shifts how we do ministry. We don't do for others. We don't do for credit, for our selfie, while we do for others. We are not empowered over them to do for others. We are with them. We are walking with them. Loyalty to God doesn't put us above other people. It puts us alongside them, especially alongside their pain. And that's why, for Jesus, allegiance to God demanded that he align himself daringly with the poor, with the hungry, the imprisoned, the sick, the stranger, and the weak. The Gospels show us a, a Savior who was concerned with shaping a beloved community. He didn't care much for privilege and he didn't cling to his own. And he knew all too well the brutality of a great empire that regarded itself as the best and most virtuous nation the world had ever known. The banner of Rome demanded Jesus' allegiance, but he refused to bend his knee to its pride and to its violence, and that may have cost him his life. Now, I love my country. I love the 4th of July. By the way, I hate fireworks. If I find your address and you're shooting off fireworks, you're in trouble. Anyway, I intend to celebrate later today. I'll probably read the Declaration of Independence. I'll maybe cook some Johnsonville brats. I'll contemplate and give thanks for the America that was and the America that is. But I also plan to contemplate and pray for the country we might have been and the country we still could be. I do hope that all of you will have a 4th of July filled with clear-eyed and chastened love of country and with ardent prayers for our leaders, as the Bible commands. And I hope you will also take a moment to pray for the profound conversion of all Americans, of you and from me, to a resolute path of justice, solidarity, and peace in a world where everyone else loves their country too. And in this spirit, I freely say, and I mean it with all my heart, God bless.